Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa buddhang damang sangang namasami. So, in traditional circles, Buddhism, uh, monks often begin with that. That is a honor to the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha. And this is, in a sense, the next blessing. So we covered at least partially the first two benefits, which are not to associate with the foolish, to associate with the wise, and that can be treated exhaustively. That is such a beautiful way to start and so important in life. It's, it's kind of the essence of what people talk about in their life. Time they spent with difficult people and time they spent with positive people this is often the story of your life. So continue, I would encourage you to continue to investigate those two things. This third one is to honor the worthy ones. That's a translation, but the, the Pali is puja chapujanyanam. So puja is actually a worship kind of ceremony. A puja is is an honoring ceremony. So this is actually the great transition in life. This is the single pivot point of life. Do you have someone in your life that you honor, that you regard as worthy of honor? And until you do, the sense of collectedness in your life will be absent. You will be wandering aimlessly. You will only have your own self as a guide. Is there something higher than you? Is there something more that you would look up to? And this is actually one of the big problems of modernity because everything has come under question. We're living in the postmodern times. We're living in the post-Christian times. We're living in post-religious times in some sense. We're living in religious absence and we're living in scientific presence. But science itself is also dissolving in front of our eyes. It was a kind of authority figure, but you can see in contemporary times Everything is subject to question, to ridicule, in fact. When there is nothing honorable in your life, nothing that is not merely addressed sarcastically or dismissively, you will have an experience of, of modernity. You will have an experience of absurdity as well. So you don't have a value that you can commit to. You have no commitment. So this also is just mere wandering, aimless wandering, because you have no destination. If you have no higher value, you have no destination. If you have a higher value, then you have a destination. You have a, a point towards which you're going and that is to internalize the qualities of that which you admire and you honor and you respect. And that's a beautiful thing. Those qualities are embedded in the human psyche as very positive, and lots of people have not discovered them. It's the nature of the culture of this time. It was virtually uh, universal in previous times. I'm trying to think of any social structure which didn't impart a reverence for some higher value and people who represented that higher value. In uh, Buddhism, we hold in highest esteem the Buddha, but the Buddha is not in a place, he's not some place as an individual. 
So it's different than some other religious ideas. Some, of course, uh, religions have what they think of as a living deity or a living avatar or something on, who's alive now and they reverence them. The Buddha is long gone, 2,500 years ago, and said just near the end of his life, after my death, neither gods nor humans will see me. And so this is disturbing for some people. They would like him to be someplace. And I think uh, in certain ways that some Buddhist cultures are not aware that the Buddha said, <laughs> neither, neither gods nor humans will see me. So, and actually, that's all right, but the Buddha did say much earlier in his life that whoever sees Dhamma sees me, and whoever sees me sees Dhamma. Now, you could substitute the word truth for Dhamma. Whoever sees the truth sees me. Whoever sees me sees truth. What does that mean? The Buddha is, in his thought, speech, and actions, he's one with the truth. And this is not just any truth. It's not scientific truth. It's one specific truth. And the truth is, there is suffering. There is a cause of suffering. There is an end to suffering. There is a way to the end of suffering. This is the truth which the Buddha gives preeminence to. So all of his thought, speech, and action is in accord with that reality. And so when you come to investigate the blessings of life, remember, of course, that this is in the context of, of Buddhism. And it always is hearkening back to this, the nature of the truths, the essential truths, the important truths. So this is a, this is a humanistic existential teaching. It is the blessings which the human heart responds to in the deepest way. So we are proceeding from leaving the foolish behind. Now, the foolish would have been those who have no regard for these truths. They haven't found the value structure which is centered around the truths of suffering and the end of suffering. So they're, they're preoccupied with other things. The wise have that issue at the center of their lives, the nature, the, the sensitivity and vulnerability of the human heart, how it makes mistakes, how it suffers. This is the center of the wise person's lives. And to honor the worthy ones is, is to have in high regard those who have solved the problem. The existential problem. Now there are whole systems of teachings where nobody has solved the problem and nobody can solve the problem. Buddhism is not one of those teachings. There is a problem. The problem is various shades and layers of distress, problematic suffering, and it is possible to solve it. And it is possible to solve it through your own efforts, and some people have solved it. So there's a certain amount of commitment and faith that somebody, some have solved this. It is possible to come out the other side on this. So that's, the Buddha regards this as very important to your psyche, that if you don't have this embedded in your psyche, then you will be lacking. You will be, mm, You'll be trying to sort things out on your own, probably unsuccessfully. By the way, there is a, uh, uh, in Buddhist teachings, there are beings in the past, before the time of the Buddha, who the Buddha claimed actually did manage to solve the problem of suffering themselves without external teachings. 
And that's a very rare thing. So there were, he, he says, there are spiritual geniuses. They rise from time to time. But to achieve that on your own in a time when nobody in the culture around you has achieved that is a very remote possibility. And in a time of a Buddha, which lasts for a long time, we certainly 25, 2600 years now, the teachings are still available. And in this day and age, even more available. As you see, you're watching this on the internet. It's massively available now. This is a, an, an interesting and auspicious time in history that these benefits and blessings are available to one worldwide. So this seems to indicate that we're actually in a very rich and uh, auspicious time in history, that there is a return of of the awareness of the path. So the worthy ones are those who have walked the path. And the path, so the Buddha says, he was asked near the end of his life again, are there people in other different religions or philosophies or places who have attained enlightenment? And he said, wherever the path is found, there you will find beings of the first, second, third, and fourth stages of enlightenment. If the path is found there, the results will be found there. If the path is not found there, you will not find people who have attained awakening, stages of enlightenment. So it's very much a, it's a matter of information, availability of information a familiarity with the path. And then quite often, perhaps especially in the West, one might feel that this is a particularly Asian kind of um, process. The path, Buddhism, etc., is an Asian type of religious experience, but it's not. It's very universal, and wherever the path is found, there you will find the results of the path. Just as in uh, mathematics. Mathematics is not West or East. And you'll find people of brilliance, both in the West and the East, all different places and races. So this is the same with this. This is, should give you some sense of autonomy as well. You are not actually reliant on an external source for your awakening from suffering. Nobody can bestow it upon you but you must walk the path yourself. On the other hand, it can't be kept from you either. If you can get a hold of the information, the treasure map, you can find your way to the treasure. So it's very worthwhile to explore this and to at least hold the possibility that people have accomplished this path. So this is... Uh, these first three blessings are absolutely critical and they're a, a change of direction in uh, your existence, a radical change. As we go on, the next one is to reside in a suitable location. So we've, we've dealt with some very important things and that is the human location. You're residing with people and you have chosen to move out of, a, of the broken down house of foolish people and move into the beautiful house of the wise. And you have an ultimate aim manifested and embodied in worthy people. So you now have a physical environment as well to remain in. And this also is not to be, you're not to be indifferent to your, the place where you live. So this is to reside in a suitable location. There are places that the Buddha says are more conducive to your well-being and peace and those which are less. So for instance, and some people think that, you know, an enlightened person should be indifferent to their environment, but the Buddha made choices about where he stayed. All of the monks at the time, the Arahant monks, the fully enlightened, chose places to stay. 
So it's still a matter of choice. You, you have no choice but to make choices. Where will you stay? So the Buddha gives some suggestions for if you're very immersed in the spiritual practice, if you have gone forth as a monk or a nun at the time, then you should reside in a monastery. And by the way, the description and the urging of the Buddha throughout his life was monks go to the forest. Stay in the forest. Reside in the forest. There is a, a large number of monks that in the present time and for centuries have ignored that and end up downtown in big cities. And it's somewhat forgotten that the Buddha is very, very specific about the suitability of the forest for the monks. So you see this reform movement towards forest dwelling monks, the peace of the countryside. Nature is of a low sensory experience. You may be thinking while I'm talking about nature that you love nature, that you, you find it very engaging. But it's, uh, it's nature and it's not uh, human made, so it has a less of a stimulating effect on the mind or less of an unwholesome stimulating effect on the mind. City, urban places, those constructed by humans are with human values and they can often be very distracting. If you're not of a materialist persuasion, if you're not of the sensory persuasion, then a city is advertising all of the sensory uh, experiences in life. It's distracting to the mind that is seeking serenity and peace. Nature is much more conducive to that. So the Buddha talks about staying away from the density of human contact in the quiet. Now, lots of people find that idea unlikable they like human company. They want to chit chat all day long. They want to be around people all day long. This is ordinary human nature. But as you progress along the path, and some people are inclined this way without any exposure to spiritual things they like, they enjoy solitude, they enjoy nature. So this is a withdrawal from excessive frivolous noise, frivolous activities, frivolous speech, frivolous interactions, and learning to appreciate that, that is supportive to the spiritual life. So that's very clear for monastics, but what about lay people, or you have families and jobs? Well, sometimes it's simply impossible. You can't live in the forest. You have, you have dependents, and you have jobs, and you have businesses, and you have employees, and that, or you're an employee, etc. You, you have to work somehow around this. But you can see that some environments are dreadful. They're, it's too noisy, it's polluted, it's obnoxious, it's dangerous. So that's one of the things that you can do for yourself is to always have an aim say not to tolerate these situations, to always aspire to free yourself from these noisy, harsh, dangerous, irritating kind of locations to, to live in, both for your own sake and all, as well for your family. And it's amazing where people live and don't manage to lift themselves out of the situation. Sometimes, of course, you, you can end up in prison. <laughs> and in that case, you, you don't have much choice. And not everybody that ends up in prison is because they're immoral. Sometimes it's because you're moral that you end up in prison. There was a case of uh, Thoreau ending up in, in prison. 
because of a, a moral issue. And the philosopher who lived in the same village with him, Emerson, came to visit him in prison. And Emerson stood outside the bars and said, Henry, what are you doing in there? And Thoreau looked out the bars at Emerson and said, Ralph, what are you doing out there? <laughs> so anyway, Emerson bailed out uh, Thoreau, much at the protest of Thoreau himself. He didn't want to be bailed out, but Emerson said you shouldn't be in there. People, Gandhi, of course, many, many people who are very moral, very developed, uh, can end up in prison as political prisoners, as prisoners of conscience, etc. So uh, you sometimes don't have choices about your environment. In that case, if you read the accounts of people who are highly developed in the interior, you will see that they, they didn't have such a bad time in prison. Gandhi said it was a very pleasant and meditative time. <laughs> so for some people it's hell on earth because the hell that they carry around is in their mind. And so when they're trapped with themselves in a situation, they bring hell to the situation. Others can bring heaven to the, to the situation. So if you can get out of it, get out of it. If you can't get out of it, get into it. <laughs> so you have to deal with the, the physical constraints of the situation, but if you can bless yourself with a better environment, do it. Of course, worldwide right now, this, is, this word environment is on everybody's lips. We're concerned with the environment of the entire environment of the planet. And because we haven't been living skillfully, we have been distracted by the, the sensory candy and not taking care of ourselves and not taking care of the environment. We're, we're degrading the entire situation, the entire environment, and, and it comes back on us. So this is, um, it ties in with, with the entire planetary civilization and to appreciate that certain environments are much better and conducive for human happiness and well-being and to regard that as a blessing and to seek it out for yourself and to offer that advice and help to others to also improve the environment they're living in. The next blessing is to have done good deeds in the past. Now this is something you, if you haven't, you're out of luck. <laughs> now, so what should you do if you haven't done good deeds in the past? Well, one thing, if you have, and everybody has done something good, actually the Buddha does advise you to review those, your good deeds. Now, lots of people think that they shouldn't dwell on their good deeds, that they maybe should dwell on their faults and uh, that it would be conceited or, you know, that to dwell on your good deeds. The Buddha says, no, 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 uh, milk them for all they're worth. Having done good deeds, recall having done good deeds. Bring that up, make yourself positive. Enjoy the fact that you have done good things. Remember them. However, this is the past and you can't, it's, you can't go back to the past and do some more good deeds back there. But what can you do, of course, is good deeds now in the present. So if they were good, if it was a good idea to have done things well in the past, it's also a good idea to, have to do things, to do good deeds now in the present. You can enrich your life by doing this. This is the enrichment of the, this is how you bless your life is actually by doing good things. And what are the good things? Well, there's multiple ways of doing good things. And uh, one of the easiest ones is just simply to share and be generous and to enjoy the idea of like how you can contribute to the well-being of others. And it also means being generous to yourself, not to be stingy with yourself. You see this interesting configurations of personality where people actually have abundance and uh, they actually might even 
be generous to others but not to themselves. And this is, this is a pity. So you, you need to be both generous. You, you should give gifts to yourself and to others and not to neglect anybody. So this is a simple good deed that you can do. Even children can do this. And if you have children, you should start them early with the idea of that they can share things. And there's a warm flow through your body mind when even with a child a, of three or so, just sharing, a, so feeding a, a puppy or sharing a cookie, offering a cookie to another child or any of these things, you can start them off early in life to feel the positive feedback loop of giving. When you, as you give, you get. If people have not experienced this, they don't know about that. They don't, they don't understand. They, it always seems threatening to them that somebody wants them to give some of their things away. But if they understand the positive feedback loop, they will be actually eager to do that. The enjoyment, the delight, actually. The del generosity is a delight. Sharing all of the basics and the necessities of life, and sometimes a few of the luxuries of life as well. So the, the Buddha is not advocating that everybody becomes a, a mendicant, an alms mendicant, you know, living with rag robes under a tree. He's not advocating that. He doesn't, he knows that that's not realistic. There are certain small portion of the population that are interested in a full-time engagement in the contemplative life, and they will prefer to live in a very simple manner. But uh, most people have other things which they regard as beautiful. And, and the, the Buddha is very skillful in telling you how to achieve those things and how to dwell in those and how to flourish in the midst of those things as well. Ultimately, even acts of generosity and living in a nice place, etc., will not uh, ultimately free you from the, the existential situation of suffering but it will improve the situation temporarily, at least, and give you an opportunity, perhaps, to go to higher things. So I should mention also that the overall ordering of these blessings is that they go from uh, low to high, and the lowest ones are actually magnificent. So they start with magnificence and go up. <laughs> The blessings of, not, of being out of association with the foolish is a magnificent blessing. And it goes up from there. So these are escalating in value and refinement. Uh, but I don't, want to give a, I don't want to give away the ending of the story. <laughs> so I will just leave it for now with these. Uh, we have now covered five particular blessings. To not associate with the foolish to be with the wise, to honor the worthy ones, to reside in a suitable location, and to have done good deeds in the past, and of course in the present as well. So we have five magnificent experiences that improve the quality of human existence. And we will continue on with many more blessings and presence to be showered upon yourself and others.